Since we are a work group together, we'll get started with the antitrust uh, policy, and that is Rezo strives to increase competition in the marketplace and will not be a forum for anti-competitive conduct. The Rezo antitrust policy governs the activities of Rezo and its members, including this meeting. A link to the policy was emailed to you with the meeting agenda. Please consult Rezo Council if you have any questions about the policy. So there we go. Um, Broker advisory work group. How many new people in the room today? No new people in the room today. Oh, one or two. All right. Uh, for the couple of you that are new in the room today, broker advisory work group is exactly that. Um, we're the connection with the brokers in the community. Um, and Sam the other day, I think, I think I've seen this slide at least twice, put something up on the screen and it talks about the cycle of creation and implementation for standards. And broker advisory is, is a big part of that. Um, a lot of things start in broker advisory and then filter out into other work groups. And you're gonna see that with R&D later on. Um, Nino will go up and help talk about that a little bit. But ultimately, a lot of stuff comes in from the brokers who aren't necessarily the people that are in this room. So, and the way that manifests, manifests itself is uh, large and small. Like if you're familiar with the broker back office policy, or the one feed data policy, all of those started as conversations in the broker advisory work group. In those cases, those actually went outside of Rezo, uh, went through CMLS, I happened to be involved in some of the work groups that were part of that. Uh, they became now, they became LEAP, and ultimately they became an AR policy. And you also see that in a simpler scale, uh, the working with real estate data courses, those came out of broker advisory, and also today you'll see case studies for social media links and for agent bios that are you know, a pain point for the brokers that uh, they don't necessarily know that there's a path or solution until a conversation started. So with that, real quick, one of the challenges that we have though is getting brokers engaged in this conversation. Um, I think you saw that with uh, Omni yesterday talking about in Europe how they have to educate about Rezo. Um, Rebecca mentioned that I think we're up to 33 broker members, which actually is a pretty small amount compared to all the MLSs and all the brokerages in the United States. So real quick show of hands, how many people in the room have been involved in a broker advisory work group, meeting, conversation, anything along the way? A couple hands, actually much smaller. So if you haven't, I encourage you to. By the way, just out of curiosity also, how many actual brokers or broker staff do we have in the room today? Um, yeah, like five, and that's pretty typical, right? We've got 300 people here in attendance, only a handful of brokers. So most of the people that are in broker advisory are either interacting with brokers as an MLS, as a tech vendor, maybe a consultant, maybe an attorney, uh, but there's very few actual brokers that are involved. And a lot of times that's because they don't have the technical knowledge to interact with us. They don't know that we exist. Um, or frankly, maybe it's just not timely. I mean, brokers are busy people, and if it's not on fire, they're usually not paying attention to it. So one of the things that we had uh, somebody say, I think it was two years ago, and I can't remember the individual, they were off on that side, but they said, you know what, we should all adopt a broker. They said, I could be your, I could be your data dad if you're a broker, or your data mom, depending on who you are. Um, and I think that's really important. So one of the things I'd encourage you is if you have interest in this, um, you know, Dan Troop said the other day, you know, in his case, his brokerage is both upstream and downstream from the data, right? A lot of times brokers are involved in creating the actual data that we all use and disperse amongst each other and fuels what we do. So I'd encourage you to be involved in that. And one of the things that we like to do at these sessions is to bring somebody on stage. We've had uh, giant multi-state national brokers. We've had, uh, last time we had a broker that I think had less than 10 agents. So we're very excited to have our special guest here today. So. Actually, I'll have my amazing uh, vice chair and Zane, our guests, come up to the stage and we'll get started. All right, Thanks. good deal. Yeah, was Appreciate it. Welcome. Uh, and Zane, like, literally just got back into town, didn't you? I did. I was uh, at another conference uh, somewhere else. Nice. Yes. All right. No, that's fair. We mentioned the name of that conference. Oh, we did? Okay. So it's okay. I didn't know if it was... But you're here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> it's not taboo. All right. Um, so, Nina, if... Oh, by the yeah, way... Yeah, I, I kind of want Zane to introduce himself, though, because I don't... I don't. Did you do that? Uh, we haven't oh, introduced anybody, oh. so you guys take, your, take oh. turns. Okay. okay. After you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Zane Burnett. I am the Chief Digital Officer for Willis Allen Real Estate. They're a local brokerage here. 
Uh, we service the San Diego County area, seven offices, a couple hundred agents, mainly focusing on the luxury coastal real estate, um, but we do cover the entire county. Uh, it's a brand that's been around since 1914, um, and yeah, still going strong. Nice. And since I, she probably needs no introduction, but because Nina's already been on stage a couple times, but yeah. Nina, what's your tie to broker advisory? What's that? What's your tie to broker advisory? Why are you what's, here? Why am I here? What? Who are you? Why are you here? <laughs> um, I'm Nina Desange. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Strategy Officer at Vanguard Properties. We're an independent company in the San Francisco Bay Area, 18 offices, um, and 500 agents. Nice, very good. So, and I'm Jeff Bosch. I'm the chair of the work group. I'm an act, M ML. Eh, I can't talk. I'm an MLS guy, but I was a broker before then, and so a lot of the conversations we have carry through in different parts of the industry to have that connection between the brokers and the technology. But this is a, a work group that's kind of near and dear to both Nina and mine's heart as far as being able to create that connection. So, um, Zane, a lot of things going on yeah. in the real estate business. So a lot of stuff. Um, anything new and exciting? Anything that you're working on that you kind of... Yeah, some of the things that we're really interested in and working on right now all tie around um, just data, which is kind of apropos to the conversations that right. I think we've all been having. Um, specifically, as data becomes more accessible, um, more ingestible, being able to tie those data points um, to other sort of adjacent uh, processes within the real estate transaction. So ultimately, and I think that, I think what um, we're starting to hear more and more about is just that universal view of either a home or listing or the consumer uh, into like a customer data platform, um, or something similar or akin to that. So uh, I have been involved in sort of an under the radar skunk works type project um, that attempts to tie together uh, all the various consumer data points to the data points of a listing, um, and then the subsequent transaction. Gotcha. Yep. And do you find the data that you need easily accessible for that? Um, accessible, yes. Uh, ingestible, that's a different story. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so. Anything you can elaborate on that? Sure. So, I mean, one of the biggest problems we have, um, or that I'm having right now, is. When you're ingesting data and you're trying to tie together uh, records to a single source or a single point of contact, you need, obviously, standardization is key. Right. Um, and because we're pulling from so many disparate sources to include the MLS, uh, standardization on the ingest is, is a bit of a problem. Okay. Um, once we get it, like the internal standardization isn't so tough. Um, but yeah, just the, the various the, the varying degrees or levels with which the data that we're getting is actually standardized, especially with the MLS, because um, you know it's the same product across the board. Like you know, with the MLS, it's it's a home, it's a home, it's a home, it's a home. Um, so to deal with you know so so many different data sets, right? And the way those data the data values are sent to us, um, that's been a bit of a struggle. Gotcha. So different wa different ways that you ingest it, different types. Is there data that you can't get that you try to get? Yeah. Um, oftentimes when we're dealing with an MLS, you know, and I think I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, um, you know, when we're, we're, we're working with a few brokers actually on this sort of as a collaborative thing in various parts of the country. And so one of the things that, you know, the first questions we ask when we go to start the process of ingesting the MLS data is, A, how much is it gonna cost? B, what is it gonna look like? and C, what am I gonna be able to get? And that answer is different with every MLS that we talk to. Um, and when it comes to things that we're able to get or not, um, some of the things that we've run into in terms of issues, uh, something as simple as you know, which office uh, an external agent belongs to. Um, can't get that in some MLSs. Uh, we recently ran into a problem with modification timestamps. Um, you know, with the, with the data that we were getting had the same exact modification timestamp for all you know 10,000 listings mm -hmm. um, because that MLS thought that the modification timestamp meant the last time that that record was updated by them. And so since all records were updated by them at the same time on the same day, every listing had the same exact modification timestamp, which is not very helpful to me. So those are just a couple of examples of, of things that um, I ran into. Okay. Um, 
in our prep call, you were talking about kind of tying all of the consumer uh, information to the property and mm -hmm. to, to the agent. And what challenges are you finding? Yep, uh, back to just the standardization of that data. There's no standard ID, for example, um, for a listing that's been in the MLS multiple times. So we have like address, um, but you know, 323 Northeast 3rd Street is different from 323 any, you know, 3RD. Um, and so being able to, you know, it's up to us to be able to say this is the same property. Um, and the same thing goes for agents. Um, if an agent hangs their license up with a brokerage and then disappears for a couple of years, gets re-licensed and then hangs it up at the same brokerage or a different one, like there's no way for us to know that that's the same agent. Right. Um, so being able to take, especially when you're trying to get um, like a macro historical view of some of the data, um, it can be tough um, because there are no standard IDs kind of tied into the core components of the data set that we're ingesting. I think they're working on that. Are they yeah. working on that? Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. cool. That'd be nice. Yeah. Yep. Oh, um, so uh, let's talk about uh, San Diego as, a, as an area. Um, you have multiple MLSs in mm -hmm. San Diego. Let's talk about kind of the, the challenges that you, feel you face with like those third party uh, vendor providers yeah. on the MLS side. So San Diego, I've worked in a few markets. San Diego has been a little bit unique for me. I don't know if anybody here deals with San Diego um, MLS data, but there, it's, it's one market with two major MLSs. Um, and there are some extenuating circumstances that kind of led to the situation we're in right now that is unique to this market, which I don't think we need to go into. Um, but the fact of the matter is that within San Diego specifically, it's served by CRMLS, which I'm sure we're all familiar with that. Um, and then there's another MLS, the SDMLS. Um, and so the way the listings are set up or the way that they're intended to operate is that for anybody who enters a listing into CRMLS, there's a reciprocity agreement that says, you know, within moments that that listing data will get transferred over into SDMLS and vice versa. Um, for whatever reason, that's not what happens all the time. Um, and that is especially true for things like historical data. Um, so if a listing sells in CRMLS, the sales price, the area, the, you know, the, the recording date, all that stuff may or may not get over into the SDMLS. And so for this market specifically, when you're trying to take a look at MLS data for historical pricing trends, closing data, things like that, uh, oftentimes what we find is that without a bit of really hard work, um, that data is incredibly skewed. And so that's the problems that we face as a brokerage, but then when we engage with a third party, um, I can't tell you how many times we've had very, and I won't name any of them, very, very large and established organizations kind of scratch their heads and say, wait a second, what's going on here? Um, I've literally had to hop on calls with engineering teams of gigantic companies to try and explain to them how to get the data in so that it displays in a way that I think is standard for any brokerage, like get our listings on the site, yeah. for example. You know. Do you see any trends that are making that worse in the local market or anything that's happening in the business that's kind of exacerbating that? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I would say exacerbating it. I know there's some noise. So, you know, I can't tell you how many, like because I either didn't have the time or, or resources to be able to try and deal with that. I've engaged with quite a few like standardization companies mm -hmm. um, of which there are a handful. Um, which is funny because oftentimes like what they're getting and then putting back out to us is even worse than what I was getting like on my own. Um, and again, not to name, I won't name any names, but uh, it's just, you know, it, when you're talking about data and standardizing it, um, you know, there's two steps to standardization, right? Like there's the standard of what you're getting and then they're standardizing it once you have it for like data portability and interoperability and things like that. When that's an issue, and then you have like three, four, five companies saying, hey, we can do it, and then so you talk to them and you realize, no, you can't, um, it, I don't know if it exacerbates it, but it does make the process a lot more painstaking. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, we kind of went past it a little bit, Yeah. Um, so maybe this is hard to retro back to, but the 
consumer data platform. So mm -hmm. when you when we talked about that on the phone, like I, I had a whole there's too many acronyms in this business. When he said CDP to me, that meant like a totally different thing from another project that I was involved in. But yeah. I'm just kind of curious if you could share like what are you trying to do with that or yeah. what, what's your goal out of that? So the goal out of that is as a brokerage, and I think NAR came out with some, I don't know what the exact number is, but the average broker has, you know, eight or nine tools. Don't quote me on that, but it's it's more than one, right? Um, you have your email marketing, you have your transaction management, you have your CRM, you have your website, you have your digital advertising, you have document management, you have accounting. Um, those are and those are just the core products that most brokerages have. Um, there, oftentimes there are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten more tools than that. And so if you look at the the sales funnel of any particular. Uh, either homeowner or home buyer as a prospect, hopefully eventually a consumer, that person is getting bounced around between several different tools. Um, they may start out uh, by responding to uh, a call to action on an email marketing campaign that you sent them. Or maybe they started out by, by filling out a form so that you could get, they could get mailed a PDF because they saw an ad that you placed on social media. And then from there, they go to any one of your websites that you might have. Um, they engage in property search. Maybe they send some properties to their loved ones or another friend. Um, maybe they save some properties. Uh, at the end of the day, there are so many things that that person's doing, um, but it's never viewable from like the single scope of one tool. And so when we talk about CDP, it, what we're trying to accomplish is tie that one single consumer record across every tool, every tool that the brokerage is using. So that way we can make better use of the tools that we're using. So for example, if I send an email marketing campaign out to somebody and they engage, but then they go on to my website and they start doing something completely different, um, I wanna know that. So that way I can kick off triggers to be able to, uh, to do other things, whether it's serve them ads via social, uh, whether it's to engage them on another journey through email marketing, um, right now, we're highly dependent on either the marketing staff to do that on their own, or um, perhaps even more frighteningly, the agents who are trying to uh, close the business with that particular consumer. And so if we're able, the dream is if we're able to say, hey, look, here's John Doe, and here's everything he's done in sequence and chronologically across the nine tools that you have him or her engaged on, here's the next best step to take that's what we're hoping to be able to accomplish. Right now, there's a lot of gut and intuition involved there. Um, you know, or some like, you know, programmatic logic, like, you know, sit down every Tuesday and, you know, dial, you know, dial through your, your contacts or whatever it is. That's great. Um, we're just trying to be a little bit more um, accurate with, with how we deal with a lot of the people that are coming in to our funnel. And so that's, that's sort of the goal there, um, is to have that that bird's eye view of exactly what the consumer is doing, where they're doing it, and when they're doing it. Um, because there are a lot of creative things that we can do once we have that. Right, and I think most brokers struggle to have any handle on that information whatsoever. So yeah. it's Agreed. a great project. Yeah. Yep. yeah, it gets lost in the ether, I think. Yep, Currently, sure. yeah. Yep. Um, Future standards. I think we had some. Yeah, questions future about standards. That. So, um, <clears throat> well, it's something that we'll talk about a little bit later too. But one of the things that uh, I was asking Zane was how beneficial it would be for him as a broker. I know how it would how it would uh, serve our brokerage, um, but in terms of um, agent bio information and photo information and social media links, and if that could all be sourced directly from the MLS and fed out to all of the third-party vendor sites, how much easier would that make your job? Uh, it would make it a lot easier. Um, I think we all, anybody on the brokerage side has had that battle. I've had it for the last 10 years plus of taking what the MLS will send and then supplementing that or editing it to look like what we want. Um, and that, when you talk about like pains, that's a major pain. Um, because not only is it duplicate data entry on the part of staff, but it's also just like, why can't we, why, why, why can't we do this, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and, and when it comes to just like that particular, those, those data sets or those data fields, it also has to do with, I can't tell you how many times we've taken our own listings in from the MLS and then swapped them out with 
um, you know, higher res photos or a higher count of photos or you know, took that 500 character limit description and then put in a real one because that's what we want to have um, feed out to whatever our third parties are using. And so to have like agent bios is one of those things that just seems like a no-brainer um, that would help out immensely um, because really what's happening now is we're, we're doing a lot of copy-paste. Yeah. Um, and there's room for error. And I mean, I think from a brand identity perspective, uh, it's a really great idea to be able to have that kind of um, control over your, the image of your agents. And I think that that's, that, that's something, I, I mean, on our end, when you look across the board at your agents and you see that you know they might have a $5 million listing, but they have no photo and they have nothing on Zillow or realtor.com or anything, so they have no presence uh, you know, um, th that's a forward-facing presence. We would love to see the opportunity for us to be able to kind of provide that and from a professional perspective, right? That's a basic basic thing in terms of profile photo and bio information. Yep. And we'll see that carry on into the next work. You get to be yes. on stage again after this, so that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this we bounced around a couple ideas that we had for the conversation today, and this one is... Unscripted, so forgive okay. me, but no worries. Um, you know, we've talked a lot in the conversation about standardization and about MLS data and how mm -hmm. it affects you and multiple different MLSs. But we also, before you got here today, had um, a group of uh, startups on stage and looking at how they can use the data. And you know, the MLS is kind of the both sides of the coin, right? About access to data and how it's used and you know how it's watched over that it's used for the right thing. So. In the brokerage ecosystem, outside of that, I'm sure that you interact with vendors that want to grab your data that's maybe outside of the MLS. Sure. Space. So how does that look from your perspective? So the way that looks is, I mean, the easy answer is it's entirely dependent on the vendor who's providing the services. Right. Um, and so that's a conversation I was having at a different conference that I was at uh, prior to I coming no here. I noticed the booth. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Fresh, off the, fresh off the planes. Um, it's, it's sort of the same conversation, just with different vendors. I mean, the, I feel like there's this, there's this sentiment that either brokers don't know the amount of data that they're generating and sitting on, which is extremely valuable, um, or they're being held hostage by the people who are storing it. And so um, when we talk, and boy, am I tempted to use some names here, but I won't. When we talk <laughs> about some of the larger vendors who hold, I mean, volumes of very valuable data um, that's generated specifically post-transaction or mid-transaction, um, to be able to access that data in any easy or um, digestible way is so hard. Um, it's extremely difficult, and that's a shame because that data is so valuable um, to so many aspects of not just the the, the singular focus of the customer journey, um, but also in all the value that can be provided ancillary to the purchase or sale of that home. And so while I do see the MLS has kind of always on some degree offered the, the, the data that the brokers are providing them back to them, um, that's not necessarily the case with a lot of the vendors. And so there is a big movement um, in the vendor space, particularly from brokers and people advocating on behalf of brokers to build products that are either API first, um, or if you're a legacy product, um, to at the very least enable brokers and vendors to be able to access that data. I mean, I'm accessing data right now um, from, a big or from a big vendor uh, via uh, a mirror database that I have to RDB into and then write queries on and then have that transported back to me, which is kind of a pain in the butt, but it's also at the same time, I was so elated to be able to do that. Um, but how many brokers are equipped, or even third parties are equipped to be able to you know, stand up an instance in AWS and you know, buy a static IP so that this remote database can whitelist you um, and then you know, build jobs that query that database and transport the data back into an S3 bucket? Like, the answer is not a lot. Um, so it would be really nice if, if vendors could kind of 
follow suit with uh, opening up data access. Gotcha. And we didn't even talk about standardization of that we data did not. or process. We do did you, not. Do you find that outside the MLS space? Uh, not really, though I'm not as surprised or annoyed by it. Um, just because with those vendors, there are, I mean, you're talking about different types of data. Right. Right? And so, I mean, if I worked with nine vendors that all, you know, stored housing data, I would be annoyed if it wasn't, like, standardized to some degree. Right. Um, but I do understand that, you know, you have financial data, you have consumer behavior data, you have consumer engagement data on websites or uh, on ads, you, had app, you have ad performance data. There are so many different data sets that I think it would be a little unrealistic for me to expect um, all of those to be standardized. But what would be nice, and hopefully the landscape that we'll all be in at some point in the not so distant future, is that before I engage with the vendor, and it would be nice if this would be the case for MLSs too, that I could very easily go in um, to some wiki and see exactly what data points I'll be able to access, how to call those, uh, like what the endpoints look like, what's being returned, what the, what the method of delivery is gonna be, how much it's gonna cost, you know, all of that stuff. Right now, it's kind of like, literally, it's not kind of like, it's literally like, here's what I wanna do, I'm gonna hold my breath and send an email to the vendor to see what they're gonna come back with. Um, and so, you know, in a perfect world, that wouldn't be the case. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. We got a little bit of time. Any we do have a little bit of time. I think, uh, you know, one of the questions I would have is that, you know, if you were looking out into the future in terms of, you know, what you would want to see um, and what would be the perfect kind of world for you from a data perspective, what mm -hmm. would that look like? So in a perfect... Taking the consumer um, data platform, uh, data platform yeah. uh, in mind. Yeah. So in a perfect world, what that would look like, and I'm also taking the MLS into mind, and I don't know, you know, I'll just say it. In a perfect world, like, data portability would be seamless. Um, whether that means um, what we just talked about earlier, which is knowing exactly what I'm going to get, how I'm going to get it, and how much it's going to cost me before I decide to engage, or even taking it a step further, knowing how easy it will be for me to send data um, to the vendor or the MLS, for example. Um, you know, as we deal with the limitations of the data that the MLS is sending us, there are times where I wish I could just send it to them instead. Um, and I know that that's been a part of the conversation um, at the previous conference that we were talking about. And I think there's one or two MLSs that have recently enabled uh, bi-directional data flow um, between the brokerage and the MLS. And so, um, in a perfect world, I'd be able to do that. Uh, in a perfect world, I'd be able to pick the platform I entered my data into and then send it in the standard required by either the vendor or the MLS. Um, so that way, at least as uh, uh, internally, my single source of truth looked exactly the way I wanted it to, right. and I had control over how it got disseminated. Gotcha. Um, you guys are all awake out there, right? I hear some murmurs and some laughs. Um, we do have a little bit of time. We have Zane, it, actually a short trip, long trip to be the local guy. To come yeah, no, it was a uh, curious. 15 minute drive. That's not so bad, no, exactly. No. Curious if there's any questions from the audience that maybe Zane can answer for you today. Well, Catherine, always good for the questions, appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Catherine McIntosh with Listed. I'm so curious, like you're so, data savvy, like, were you already that way or did you, were you forced to understand the landscape of technology to enable your brokerage? Like, which came first? That's a great question. That is a good question. Um, I have to think back to, to the many, many years ago when I first started in this business. Uh, I think I was forced to, um, to, to kind of be that way. I was fortunate to start in this space in like 07, 08. Um, and I worked for a small brokerage in Brooklyn at the time. And it was a family run independent brokerage and they needed a lot of help. I had uh, just started and sold a cleaning business in Tallahassee um, before moving up to Brooklyn. Um, and like the reason that my cleaning business did so well was because we were one of the, we were the only cleaning business at that time to have like a nice looking website. And so I taught myself 
Um, I taught myself how to, to build websites, and then eventually that led to me um, teaching myself like how to write more of the back end stuff. So back in the day, I was a big PHP guy. Um, and we actually built a pretty uh, robust back office management platform for that brokerage. It was sort of the, one of these wing and a prayer type things or, you know, uh, where I said, hey, like, I can build this for you. Um, you know, as a staff member, I'll never, I won't tell you the number, but I remember when I told him, I'll do it for you if you pay me. And then I crossed my fingers and it was such a low number in retrospect, but um, <laughs> looking back, like that's how it all started. And through that, I was able to build a lot of relationships and meet a lot of people, many of whom I know to this day, there's Christian Sterners over there. I met him at a conference in like 08 in Las Vegas um, when he was building stuff. And so um, by virtue of at the time, certainly not now, being young and curious and hungry and being so happy to get that meager amount that I had asked for um, way back when, um, I think that enabled me to kind of see the possibilities, um, not only of what, what could be done in the circumstances at that time, um, but also um, what could be done in the future. And so eventually what I ended up doing is uh, breaking away from that brokerage and helping a bunch of other brokerages out in the, in the Northeast. Um, and I uh, rented an office space in a tiny little company that was called WeWork in Brooklyn. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. And uh, that really opened my mind too because I was then sitting next to a bunch of like really serious engineers and advertising agencies and PR firms and things like that. And you know, being in downtown Brooklyn at that time, you know, like Etsy was right next door. Um, it was one of WeWork's first, you know, northeastern locations. Um, it really just kind of kept me interested. Um, and so, it's just by fate that I happened to be in the brokerage space. Um, and so, anyway, that was a lot of rambling. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, okay, cool. But I mean, truthfully, to have both of you on stage, I mean, one of the challenges that we have at Broker Advisory is to engage somebody at a CTO level, at a tech level, and when you get down from you know, the really large brokerages, it's really hard to find those people. So I'm assuming you probably have a lot of connections or peers you've built over time that you can share and engage with. Yeah, and that, that's always helpful. And you know, uh, it's funny. like you, it, I, I've never been a part of a brokerage where there wasn't somebody super technical, mainly because I was there. Um, but when I talk to vendors sometimes, like they'll start to talk to me like I'm, you know, like I'm in the second grade, mm -hmm. and, and I get really super annoyed. Um, and and so there's an, I've had I had an interaction um, very recently with a with a large vendor, um, and, and as I'll keep saying, I won't name any names. Um, but it was like I had to actually schedule a call with their dev team to teach them how to process the data that they were ingesting because it is a unique market here with how the, the MLS data is sort of structured. Um, and I ended up having to call the president with whom I'm friends to get that meeting set because I was getting super annoyed. So um, it can be challenging um, for a brokerage that doesn't have a certain level of technical expertise to engage with vendors, and I mean, I know how annoying it is to be on a call and and like hear some very realistic expectations, like from brokerage staff, um, or like you know, hear somebody say like, "I just want to make it pop more" or whatever. You know, like <laughs> it's just it, it can be frustrating. Um, so yeah, I think it's really nice to be able to talk with people like Nina, and there are other, there are other people in the space on the at the brokerage level um, that do have that level of. Uh, of knowledge and expertise. Nice, nice, very good. So along those lines, I think you know what we're always looking for it, at the broker work group uh, is people like Zane. And so, um, and sometimes it's just somebody asking and saying, "Hey, do you mind, you know, participating?" And that's kind of how I got pulled into the work group. And so I think I'll just ask you on stage, are you willing to be part of the broker advisory <laughs> work group? <laughs> it's kind of hard to say no when you're up here, right? By, by the way, low commitment, meeting every couple months. OK, so. well, yeah, I'd have to get an idea of what the commitment level and output requirements were. Um, I, you know, I joke, but I, I have, I have uh, mistakenly, blindly said yes to things in the past. But yeah, it sounds great. And, and I actually have some friends. Um, 
mutual friends of ours that are also part of that group, and I highly respect them and, and value their opinion, and I, uh, I relish every chance I get to engage with them. Um, so yeah, sounds like a good idea. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I feel like that's the way progress happens, yeah. and so I appreciate you saying yes. Yeah. And by the way, Nina is the best recruiter we have, because every time we go to a convention or go somewhere, she's always cornering somebody, so She's don't, always getting people on stage and asking them in yeah, front of people. Like I really to am, commit. yes, yeah. that is my MO. The other way you get <laughs> soaked into the broker advisory work group is if you sit down at the wrong round table, uh, which is how I got here, so there you go. Uh, that happens. but. Um, we have just a couple more minutes. I know we were trying to catch up from this morning, so we can wind down, or does anybody else have any questions before we go? Yes, Jason. Not really a question, just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, going back to the issues with ingesting agent information, uh, Riso is working on the unique licensee identifier, yep. and you can get to uh, uli.riso.org for, there's a white paper on it, basically. Um, and then for property information, it's the UPI, uh, Universal Property Identifier, upi.reso.org, and then if you would like even further information, you can email dev at reso.org, and Josh will tell you all you need to know. That is awesome. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Jason. All right. Well, with that, I think we're... Oh, wait. One more question. So, yeah, I love the conversation about profile data. Nina, we spoke about that. I've analyzed probably 250,000 agent profiles through our software, and what I see is, like, the amount of inconsistency. But just a th couple of things to bring up as ideas, beyond the bio, the photo, which obviously, the first time they go to an MLS, they upload their photo, then they don't touch it for 20 years or 10 That's years right. or whatever. Right. Some right. people do. Um, but there's so much more. There's like service areas and like the neighborhoods they serve. And if you look at that on Zillow, it says one thing, and then on homes.com it says something else, and then on Realtor it says something else. Like even that should be sourced at the MLS or association level. So I think there's just like even more than that. I'd love to talk to anybody about it. I got a lot of data on it, but I think everybody is in, everybody's inconsistent, right? Yeah. And if there could be some standard around it, there would be a lot of sharing happening of real accurate data for the agent's benefit, for the consumer's benefit, so they know who's the right person to spoke to, the right phone number, is that their face? Like you Google people and it's just different pictures all over the place. For the I agree, person. yeah. And, and speaking of sharing, one thing we mentioned on the call that we didn't get a chance to talk about today is um, MLSs, when they do make updates to yeah. their structure or what endpoints to hit or you know, the, the, what, ex what values are available in any given field, um, it's an email to somebody. Um, th and, and so it's kind of like, Oftentimes, when we're, and, and half the time, to be honest, I don't get that email for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes, you know, we'll have something running smoothly, and then all of a sudden it won't. Yeah. Um, and there'll be an error in, in some process or something. And it's because the MLS changed the name of a field yeah. that, used, that existed yesterday, but doesn't exist now. Or they folded one in, you know, or like a, they've added values. You, you all know what I'm talking about. And so... If I can, going back to your question of what does a perfect world yeah. look like, uh, it doesn't look like some random email letting me know that a business critical function has changed and then that's it. Um, so I think in a perfect world, when we talk about standardizing data and maybe centralizing resources, maybe there's room for something to be stood up that is almost like a central repository for changes to MLS feeds. Um, because that is something that, as, as you scale and you're dealing with more and more MLSs, uh, that can really kind of cripple, or not cripple, but can really present a major road bump um, or, or a headache in the middle of the day when you realize that something didn't come through that should have. And so I think there's you know, something there, too. Gotcha. No, totally agree. Um, to the agent bio thing, too, we are going to transition. I believe R&D is next or one of yeah. the following work groups. Um, so I'd love some input on that because that is, again, something that started out of broker advisory. And when I was a managing broker, we used to always say that if the agent's headshot was older than the house that was for sale, that we might have some problem with the transaction. So um, there's a lot, a lot of room for improvement. But I mean, ultimately, again, we encourage everybody to join. And if you've got somebody, you know, they don't, the, the, the great thing about broker advisory work group is you don't have to be a techie to join. Really what we're trying to do, get to is the pain points. Rezo has the work groups to handle the rest of the stuff. So it's just really identifying where the challenges are at, where things are broken, where they could be better, what, a, 
what a perfect world looks like, and um, Rizzo's really good at handling it from there. So I think with that, thank you for- Enjoy awesome. San Diego, everybody. It's a beautiful town. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.